Calves, especially newborns, are highly susceptible to many different stressors, and these stressors can have lasting impacts on the animal's performance long term um, in terms of disease susceptibility, susceptibility to parasites, as well as uh, susceptibility to thermal or temperature stress. Um, and events that occur during early calfhood in particular can set the stage for the animal's, uh, the rest of the animal's life and how productive that animal will be. So that's why we want to pay particular attention to this stage of the animal's life. So we're gonna start out by you know, going through the natural life cycle. We're gonna start at birth and then go all the way through weaning here. Um, we're gonna pay a little bit of attention to the first 24 hours of life of the animal because that is one of the most critical times. Um, when we think about the newborn calf, one of the things that should come to your mind is colostrum. Now colostrum is the first milk of the dam um, that is rich in antibodies, proteins, and growth factors. Um, and this is important because calves are born with very little immunity and they rely on what we call passive transfer of immunity to develop their immune system. And they acquire this passive transfer by absorbing antibodies from the colostrum um, into their system. Um, and timing of colostrum consumption is really important because um, as soon as the calf is born, its ability to absorb the antibodies um, begins to decrease significantly. So um, after about 12 hours after birth, um, the majority of the calf's ability to absorb those antibodies from the colostrum is significantly reduced. And then that ability is almost completely gone after 24 hours. Um, so it's really important that the calf gets colostrum and gets it very soon after birth um, so that we maximize that absorption of antibodies. Inadequate colostrum consumption um, can lead to poorly developed, um, uh, a poorly developed immune system, which can eventually lead to uh, calf scours or diarrhea, um, respiratory disease, as well as general unthriftiness or um, uh, low production, essentially. Um, and the calves are just not going to perform nearly as well as their herd mates that do receive adequate colostrum. Um, so we want to make sure the calves are getting enough colostrum. So if you have calves that are nursing cows, uh, we want to make sure that those calves are up and nursing within four hours of birth. Sooner is better. Um, so if you aren't around to see the birth and to actually see the calf get up to nurse, you want to make sure you're looking for signs of nursing. So um, obviously the, the most telltale sign is active nursing. Um, but you also, if you're not able to you know, see the calf nurse the cow uh, directly, you can also look at the cow's udder, um, look at her, um, her teats to see if they're clean and slick. If they have matted hair or saliva around the teat end, that's a pretty good indication that the calf has found its way to nurse. Um, so those are things you can look for, but again, if you're ever in doubt of whether or not your calf is able to nurse and get up um, and, and you know, nurse the cow, um, you should always look for active signs of nursing. Um, if it was a difficult birth and the calf is having trouble, um, you can always try and guide the calf over to the cow to try and encourage it to nurse that way. Um, if there is an, an issue either with the calf or the cow, um, if it was a difficult birth or the cow is injured or the calf is not really uh, vigorous um, and it doesn't have any interest in nursing, um, you should definitely step in to ensure that the colostrum is consumed by the calf. Um, you can do this by feeding a bottle um, shown here, or you can do this um, by feeding with a tube feeder or an esophageal feeder. Now we prefer that you try to use a bottle if the calf is interested in suckling. So if you stick your fingers in the calf's mouth and it has that suckling response, that's a good sign and a good indicator that you should be able to feed it with a bottle. Um, but if the calf has a pretty weak suckling response or isn't really interested in nursing the bottle, um, then the tube feeder would be a pretty good option um, for that. Um, to use a tube feeder, we have several resources we can provide you, um, but we recommend you get trained on how to do that before you actually attempt to do it on your own. So, um, you know, you can contact your extension office or your veterinarian, you can work with them to get the technique quite right. It's a fairly simple procedure, but you need to make sure you get the tube in the right place um, because there's the esophagus as well as the trachea. And we don't want to put be, you know, be putting milk into the trachea because then the calf won't be able to breathe. Um, so we do want to make sure that we do follow proper procedure if we do go the esophageal or tube feeder route. 
Um, if you find yourself in a situation when you have to um, give colostrum either from, with a bottle or a tube feeder, um, you might be wondering, well, where do I get this colostrum from? Um, it's a really good idea that if you have a cow that's getting ready to calve or you have a cow-calf herd and it's calving season, to have some sort of plan in place for this kind of situation. Um, because chances are at some point you're gonna find yourself needing colostrum. So there are a couple different options for getting colostrum um, for your calf. Um, you can either obtain it directly from the dam by milking her. Um, the only caveat with this is that you have to have the facilities as well as the ability to milk this cow. Um, the other option, um, the other preferred option rather, is to use stored or frozen colostrum from another cow. Um, ideally, this would be from a, a cow on your, your herd, in your herd already, or it could be a, from a cow in a different herd, and it could be a dairy cow or beef cow. It doesn't really make a difference as long as it's high quality colostrum. A lot of folks will get you know, a few uh, uh, servings of colostrum, save it up, and then keep it in the freezer for calving season and then thaw it out as they need it. Um, but again, you wanna make sure that it's high quality as well as um, the animal that it comes from is healthy because you can transfer certain diseases through colostrum if you're not careful. Um, the third option is to use a colostrum replacer, which is a powdered formula that you mix with water. Um, and I do wanna note that colostrum replacer is different from the traditional milk replacer that you might uh, purchase to feed say an orphan calf or a bottle fed calf. Um, milk replacer does not contain antibodies, whereas the colostrum replacer does. So if you're looking to supplement colostrum, you know, feed colostrum, um, make sure you're feeding a colostrum replacer, not a milk replacer. Um, the issue with colostrum replacer is that it's better than nothing, but it's not necessarily as effective as fresh uh, colostrum as you would have in options one or two here but it's certainly something good you should have on hand if you do not have uh, access to fresh colostrum. Um, the next question you might have is how much do I feed? Um, so for fresh colostrum, this chart here on the left is showing um, how much you should feed in quarts according to the calf's birth weight. Um, it's recommended to feed between five and 6% of the calf's birth weight as, uh, in, uh, in quarts. Um, and for a 70, 70 pound calf, that would equate to about two quarts of fresh colostrum per feeding. Now we wanna shoot for two feedings of colostrum and the first would be within four hours of birth. Um, now you don't have to wait four hours. You could, you know, if, if it's one hour, you could feed it earlier. Earlier is always better with colostrum. Um, and then that second feeding would occur uh, within 12 hours of birth to make sure they get a second opportunity to absorb those antibodies. Um, if you're using a colostrum replacer, you're going to want to follow the feeding instructions on the bag because they are, they do vary from um, brand to brand. Um, now I don't have a brand preference, but this is just an example of what um, a bag of colostrum replacer uh, for calves would, would look like. Um, something else you want to look for besides colostrum is you want to make sure that the calf is getting cleaned off. Um, so the cow should be licking the calf clean after birth, um, and that would stimulate the calf's activity, make it get up, and stimulate to get up and, and, to, and to, to make it get up and nurse, but also helps to dry the calf um, to reduce thermal stress. Um, and this is particularly important if you are calving in colder weather, um, say March or even April to some extent, um, when, when it's kind of chilly outside still, you wanna make sure that the calf is dry. If the cow can't or will not clean off the calf, you should obviously step in and dry the calf. Um, you know, you can use towels or things like that. Um, just vigorously dry the calf. Um, and that one stimulates the activity, but also keeps it dry. Um, and then after that, you wanna make sure the calf is gonna be kept in a, a clean, dry uh, area that's sheltered from the elements, particularly from the wind, um, if the cow is not going to be able to take care of the calf outdoors or in, any, in your normal situation. Um, something else you wanna keep in mind is disinfection of the navel. Now the navel cord, once it's severed, um, will start to dry up and in a few days will fall off. Um, but until that happens, the navel cord is 
um, a prime avenue for pathogens or bacteria to get into the calf's bloodstream and make it sick. Um, so by applying a disinfectant, it not only helps to reduce the pathogen uh, load on that navel cord um, to help prevent infection, but also speeds up the drying process so that the tissue will dry up and fall off faster. Um, not everybody does this, uh, but it's something that you should definitely look into if you are calving indoors or in a dirt lot where the likelihood of pathogen exposure is much higher. Um, and to, uh, the ideal navel dip, you, it's generally recommended to use a 7% tincture of iodine, uh, but there are other non-iodine based navel dips available that you can use that work just fine. Um, we recommend using um, some sort of a, a dip cup or a vessel um, what's shown here is just a little Tupperware cup, um, and then you could also use like a no return teat dip cup, things like that. Um, you just want to make sure that you're, when you dip, you get full coverage of the navel tissue. They, all, they do make sprays, um, but I don't particularly like those because you can't, it's more difficult to ensure that you have uh, full coverage of the tissue and those, uh, with those types of applicators. Um, but you do want to make sure that you're cleaning the applicator in between calves so you're not potentially transferring. Um, pathogens between animals. Um, the last thing you want to do um, after, pretty soon after birth is put some sort of identification in place for your calves. Um, this is not only important for production record keeping, but um, it's really important for health record uh, keeping, um, especially if you ever have a calf that's sick that needs some sort of treatment, it's important to have some sort of identification in place. Um, for little calves, generally, this is going to be something like an ear tag, as shown here. Um, and then if you have other forms of identification that you want to use when your calves get a little bit older, like branding or tattoos, obviously you can do those as well. All right, we're going to switch gears and talk a little bit about nutrition and feeding um, of both a traditionally raised beef calf on the cow as well as a bottle calf. Um, so for the first two months, calves are going to receive most of their nutrients from milk. Um, they will start to nibble available feed within a, within a few weeks of birth, um, and that, that can be things like pasture, hay. Um, if there's any um, you know, grain available, they'll nibble on that as well. You really want to encourage this feed exploration behavior because that will jumpstart rumen development, um, and you need a functioning and developed rumen to promote feed intake and nutrition after weaning. So we really want to encourage the calves to start eating solid food as early as possible. So you wanna make sure that there is um, high quality palatable feed available to them. Um, and during this time, uh, it's generally recommended to check the calves every day to make sure that they're active um, and growing as you would expect them to. Um, if you have a group of calves, making sure that they're all fairly uniform in size, obviously, some might grow a little bit faster than others, but you don't want to see one that's singled out looking like a little runt or something like that, unless they were born much later, or there's a, other, some explanation for that. Um, because poor vigor or growth could indicate that the calf is either sick or the dam has poor milk production or something is going on with it. So you do wanna make sure you're looking um, for those things. Um, for the for, uh, three months until weaning, the calves are gonna to continue to nurse their, their dams but they should have access to high quality pasture and forage because they are going to start eating more of that solid feed as they get older. Um, supplementation is only necessary when pastures are in poor condition or there's not enough of a high quality forage available. Um, and we'll talk about creep feeding here shortly. Um, but by three months, ideally the calves will be consuming uh, around 1% of their body weight as solid, solid feed. Um, and then as they continue to get older, their reliance on milk for nutrition is going to decrease as they start to consume more solid feed. So creep feeding, um, you may or may not have heard about, um, but it helps provide supplemental nutrition to calves before weaning. A lot of folks will start around 60 days before weaning, but some will start earlier, some will start later. Um, and for creep feeding, generally people will feed a high energy supplement or a, a high protein supplement. Um, there are commercial creep mixes available. Um, and there's also something called uh, 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 forage. You can also creep feed high, uh, high quality forages or creep graze calves as well. Um, there are several advantages to creep feeding. Um, your calves will generally have higher weaning weights because you are providing them additional 
um, nutrition. Um, you, uh, the calves will oftentimes adapt better after weaning, particularly if they're going to be um, you know, fed in a bunk situation or they're gonna be fed you know, high grain diets and things like that. The creep feeder will help get them used to that. Um, it's useful to use if you have um, poor quality forage or you don't have enough forage available. And it also can help compensate for low milk production. So if your cows are not producing a lot of milk or there's a couple of cows that aren't producing a lot of milk, creep feeding will help those cows out. Now I have a star next to that because that can also be a disadvantage in certain situations and I'll explain. Um, in terms of disadvantages for creep feeding, um, whether or not it's profitable um, on your farm is gonna depend on a variety of different factors. So, and we'll talk about that here shortly. Um, and there's also some evidence to suggest that non-creep fed calves will generally catch up in terms of uh, wean, uh, and weight gain after weaning. Um, and calves may get overly fat if they're cre creep fed for too long. Um, and that can be a problem in terms of, disc uh, you might get a discount when you send them to the sale yard, or if you're uh, creep feeding um, replacement heifers, they might get too fat and that might have negative impacts on their milk production later on. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, compensating for low milk production can also be a disadvantage because if you have a few cows that are poor milk producers, um, creep feeding can kind of mask that and that might not be something you want to hide um, if you're thinking about culling cows and, and things like that. So if you have a couple milk, you know, cows that aren't producing very well, you might want to be able to identify those so you can take them out of the herd um, for next year if they're not raising big calves. Um, the cost effectiveness of creep feeding, I said before, is dependent on a variety of different factors. Um, one of those factors, obviously, is the cost of the feed. Generally, the higher protein feeds are going to be really uh, a lot more expensive, um, as well as uh, it's dependent on how much forage you have avail available, as well as the quality of that forage. So if you have an ample supply of high quality forage, creep feeding may not pencil for your farm. Um, you also have the issue of assigning value to the additional gain you have with creep feeding um, and also estimating the additional gain you're getting from creep feeding um, and being able to determine how, how much that's returning for your farm. Um, the feed conversion efficiency of creep feeding is highly variable. So um, it can be anywhere from five pounds of feed per one pound of gain all the way up to 30 pounds of feed per one pound of gain depending on the system, the type of feed, um, that you are using. So um, it's highly variable and research studies have shown that it, it's, it's, there's a huge range um, in how efficiently animals are going to be gaining weight using the creep feeding system. Um, and it also obviously is dependent, highly dependent on calf prices. Um, and generally creep feeding is going to be likely more profitable, not always, but more likely more profitable when uh, feed prices are low, calf prices are high, and calves are sold close to weeding or calves are retained through the grain finishing phase. Um, if you creep feed calves and then sell them to someone who's gonna be stockering them, they're not going to, those, those non-creep fed calves are gonna catch right up uh, and you're gonna kind of lose that advantage. Uh, but if they're going right into a grain finishing lot, um, they'll keep that, that advantage all the way through. Um, one last note about nutrition before we continue on is I wanna mention that you shouldn't forget about water. Um, a lot of times folks overlook water, um, but water is the first essential nutrient. Um, an animal will die of dehydration faster than it will die of starvation. Um, and that's because the body is 60% water and water is needed for most of the metabolic reactions that do happen in the body. Um, animals should have clean or access to clean water at all times, regardless of age. And the reason for that is that water intake and feed intake are positively related. So um, if you don't have enough water available, the animals aren't going to eat as much, essentially, is what's going to happen there. And the, why, the reason why that's important for our pre-weaned calf is because, as I said before, we want to encourage feed intake early on. So if you don't have enough water available, you're going to be uh, depressing uh, feed intake um, inadvertently. Um, something else to note with water is when you're checking your water troughs, it's important to make sure that the calves actually will have access to the water. Um, it's, it's, it's easy to overlook this because you say, oh, there's water in the trough. The calves can reach it just fine. But it's important to remember that calves are shorter than cows. Um, that's 
pretty obvious, but sometimes it's, we forget about these things. And if the water level is too low where the calves can't reach it, but the cows can, um, that can be a problem. Or if the ground around the trough, if it's a permanent trough system, is so depressed that it's, lo it's lower, again, you have the same issue where the calves aren't going to be re able to reach the trough or the water. All right, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, bottle calves here next. Um, and, and a bottle calf is a calf that's gonna be fed on the, uh, artificially fed a bottle um, up, and up through weaning. And this can be a situation where um, it could be an orphan calf in, in a beef situation uh, where you have a cow-calf herd, or it could be a situation where you purchase a few calves from the stockyard because you wanna raise a few uh, for some freezer beef. Um, but the principles be behind feeding them are, are going to be the same. Um, generally, you're going to be feeding a milk replacer uh, based um, uh, mixture um, at least twice daily from one to two days of age uh, until six to eight weeks of age or longer, depending on your preferences. Um, and then during this time, you want to make sure you're providing access to fresh water as well as a starter grain. And your goal is to get this calf eating at least one and a half to two pounds of solid feed um, per day before you decide to wean it. Um, now I mentioned starter grain here. Um, you can also offer the calf hay, but research in dairy calves has shown that the grain is actually going to be more successful in stimulating that rumen development than hay. And if you want to shoot for um, a weaning age of around six to eight weeks, which is a bit earlier than a traditionally weaned beef calf, um, then you do definitely want to jumpstart that rumen development if you can. So starter grain is something that we do recommend for that. So some of the supplies you'll need for uh, fe feeding a bottle calf, you're gonna need milk replacer. Um, they come in a variety of different formulations in terms of protein to fat ratios. A 20% uh, protein to a 20% fat ratio is a pretty standard milk replacer that should be sufficient, um, but they do come in, like I said, a, ver a variety of different ratios. Um, the, this bag here is a 22% uh, protein, 20% fat uh, milk replacer, just as an example of how the ratios are variable. Um, and they do obviously vary in price with that as well. You're also going to need a bottle. Um, so a two-quart bottle is generally sufficient for most beef calves. Um, but then if, you're, if you've got Holsteins or something like that, you're going to want to consider a larger bottle because they are generally larger creatures and they do need a little bit more at each feeding. So this in the picture here is a three quart bottle, for example. Um, you're gonna need a bottle nipple, obviously, um, so the calf can nurse the nipple to get the milk out. And then um, you also are going to need some sort of bucket or um, vessel uh, to mix your milk replacer in. Um, I like to use a wire whisk to mix up the milk powder. It works nicely to make sure it's uniformly mi mixed. Um, you're also going to need water and grain buckets. Um, or some sort of you know, you know, trough or something like that to deliver those two things. And then of course, as I mentioned before, you're gonna need that starter grain. Um, and those starter grains generally are gonna range between 16 and 20% protein, um, which is fine. Um, they do make them that are, you can get feeds that are a little bit higher in protein, but again, the price is gonna go up as you increase protein. Um, but six, anywhere in between 16 and 20% should be sufficient. Um, so you're gonna to need to feed the calves um, at least twice a day using a bottle um, or a bucket. So if you are interested in bucket training the calves, if you have a few of them on, on milk, sometimes that can be uh, labor saving and savings and labor and things like that. Um, you can do that, but we recommend you wait until um, at least five days of age, and then you can um, start to train them to drink from the bucket that way. Um, but if you've just got one calf, you really won't save much time by training them to drink out of a bucket. So um, it's, it's not really, I mean, you, don't, you can train them to drink out of a bucket, but you don't have to. Um, and for, in terms of mixing the milk replacer, um, you should follow the instructions on the bag for feeding rates because they will vary a little bit. And it's important to use warm water to mix the milk replacer powder um, into, the, uh, into, the, uh, yeah, to, into the water. Um, because it does mix a little bit easier when the water is warmer. Um, it's important to remember to clean anything that touches the milk replacer um, after each use. So the bucket that you mix the milk replacer in, the whisk or spoon you use to mix it up, as well as the bottle and the bottle nipple should all be cleaned because milk is a breeding ground for bacteria 
And if we don't clean it, it's going to build up. And then we're obviously going to be introducing that to the calf every time we feed it, and we don't want that. Um, if a calf is doing really well, it's a couple days old, it's been drinking all of its milk, and suddenly it, just, it doesn't finish all of its milk at a particular feeding, um, that's something you should pay attention to um, because that's oftentimes the sign of one of the first signs of illness. Um, so if they're, you know, two consecutive feedings, they didn't finish all of their milk and they're not interested in, in eating all of it or drinking all of it, you should definitely check them over um, for signs of diarrhea, um, check their temperature, look for signs of respiratory distress and things like that because like I said, that can be one of the early indicators of an illness. Now, if you're purchasing a calf from the stockyard um, with the intention of either raising it as a 4-H animal or you, you want to raise it for freezer beef or what have you, um, there are a few things you should look at and pay attention to. Um, the first thing is you want to find out as much information as possible about the calf or calves if you're buying a couple. Um, you wanna know where the calf came from. You wanna know how old it is. And you also want to know how it was managed before, this, uh, before the sale. Particularly, you want to know if it got colostrum, if you can find that information out. Now, I know you can't always find that information out, but it's really important if you can to, to learn that because as I mentioned before, if calves don't get enough uh, colostrum, then they will have issues in terms of disease later on. Um, if you're looking at the physical animals, you want to look at calf vigor um, as well as their mobility to make sure that they're active, make sure they're not limping or anything uh, strange is happening with their, their walk and how their legs are structured. Um, and you want to also look at good, uh, their body condition to make sure they're not emaciated. Now, this is kind of challenging to look at in a, you know, one to two month old calf. But um, if you're looking at bigger, an you know, older animals, that's something you want to pay attention to. Um, and you also want to look at its size and make sure it's the appropriate size for its age and breed. Um, and again, if, if you're new to the industry, this can be something that's tricky. Um, but definitely looking at calf vigor and calf mobi mobility are the two big ones that you want to look at. When you're, when you're purchasing a calf. All right, we're gonna switch gears and talk a little bit about health and housing. Um, next week's Monday Moose session will be specifically about health and housing, so we're not gonna talk too much in detail about it. Um, but for calves, in terms of basic housing needs, um, again, they need available clean water at all times. They need access to shelter, um, especially during inclement weather. Um, and this can be natural shelter or man-made shelter. Um, so here is a picture of a shed. You can have something like a lean-to. It could be you know, three, two or three sides. Um, as long as they have a way to get out of the wind um, in colder weather, that's really, that's really key. Um, in terms of a, man, or, sorry, a natural shelter, you could use the woods or trees, things like that. I am a big proponent of using um, natural shelter if you can do that. Um, if you are using a shed or a lean-to of some sort for a shelter, it's important to make sure that you are monitoring the organic matter or manure uh, buildup in those facilities and making sure that you tend to that regularly because in the summertime, that becomes a prime breeding ground for flies and that can cause a lot of issues for you as well. Um, in terms of shade, um, that's kind of up in the air. Um, if it's a really hot day, uh, we, we like to see animals have access to shade, um, but if it's, you know, 50 degrees outside, they don't necessarily need access to shade because they're not heat stressed. Cows don't become heat stressed until about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so if it's um, an 85 degree day, we'd like to see them with shade if we can. Um, but if you're doing rotational grazing, sometimes that can be difficult um, to implement and balance that with proper grazing management. So that has a question mark there because it is kind of um, out for debate whether or not shade is definitely required. In terms of processing calves, um, generally uh, when we think of processing calves, we think of dehorning, castration, and vaccination. So that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit here. Um, dehorning, we wanna make sure that we're doing that um, before two months of age, if we have to do it. Now, if you're, if you're crossbreeding with Angus or some other pulled breed or some other breed that doesn't grow horns, then you don't need to worry about dehorning. Um, but if you are raising Holstein calves um, generally, or you know, some other uh, horned breed, you're generally gonna have to think about dehorning. Um, 
like I said, we recommend that this is done before two months of age. Um, and for dehorning, that's because the horn bud actually attaches to the skull um, at around eight, eight weeks of age. And then it becomes a much more invasive procedure at that point. So we recommend doing it earlier if we can. Um, and then for castration, again, earlier is better. There are a variety of different ways um, to castrate. Um, this one in the picture here is just showing um, a, how you would apply a, a band for banding. Um, but again, we're gonna talk a little bit more about health and housing next week um, in a little bit more detail. In terms of vaccinations, um, you really want to make sure you have a good relationship with your veterinarian um, and they can help you develop a good vaccination schedule that will work for you. Um, I know Jeff um, Semler mentioned in our presentation last week um, that you really should have a, a relationship with your veterinarian and, and I completely uh, agree with that. Um, this here is the, an example of a vaccination schedule. Um, so uh, in this type of schedule, the calves are getting vaccinated three different times. Uh, the first time is two to three months after birth, four to eight weeks pre-weaning, and then uh, the last set would be at weaning. Um, and the important vaccinations that we're getting in this system are going to be the respiratory vaccination, so um, IVR, BVD, PI3, BRSV, things like that, as well as the clostridial vaccinations, and then some additional vaccinations uh, would include pasteurella um, and things like that of that nature. Um, but again, you should work with your veterinarian to develop a vaccination schedule, as well as check with them, as well as the label on your vaccines to make sure that you're, uh, you're using them properly and using them on the correct types of animals, because certain vaccines will actually cause um, pregnant cows to uh, abort or lose their calves. So we wanna make sure that we're not inadvertently doing something like that. So um, always read the label when, you come, when it comes to vaccines. All right, so the last step in our journey for calf management is gonna be weaning. So I always say that the first 24 hours is really uh, important for calves, and then the weaning period is also important for them too because those are the two periods when they're gonna experience um, a lot of stress and a lot of change. So for uh, considerations for weaning, uh, we want to keep in mind that weaning involves two major stressors, the first of which is removal of milk from the calf. So that's since it's been born, that's, it's, been, it's been its primary you know, feed source. Uh, and we're also removing it from its dam. So that obviously comes with a, a whole host of emotional stress as well. Um, we want to avoid uh, combining weaning with other stressful procedures if we can, if we can, if we can do that. Um, so introducing, we don't wanna wean them and introduce them into a new environment or ship them if we can avoid it um, because that adds to the stress, the two major stressors that, um, that I showed, that I just mentioned up here. Um, during the weaning process, we wanna make sure that the calves always have access to high quality palatable feed um, because again, we're trying to sw switch them from consuming milk to um, consuming uh, a diet fully of solid feed. And then we also wanna make sure they have water, again, to facilitate and encourage that feed intake as well. Um, during the weaning procedure, it's important that you do uh, pay close attention to the calves and observe them for normal behavior. So making sure they're eating and drinking and doing normal things for cattle um, because they can become sick or dehydrated during this time very easily. Um, as you and I, we get stressed. We are, you know, our immune system is, is kind of compromised a little bit. It's easy for us to get sick. The same thing can happen to the calves. We wanna make sure that we catch those things early um, and deal with them promptly. So before weaning the calves, we wanna make sure um, if our vaccination protocol calls for it, we wanna administer pre-weaning vaccines about four to eight weeks beforehand. And again, that will help them develop some immunity to those pathogens and hopefully keep them healthy through the weaning period. Um, and then we also wanna to try to familiarize the calves to um, their environment, that's, that's what their environment's gonna be like after they're weaned. So um, if they're gonna be eating out of a bunk or if they're gonna be drinking out of a, uh, you know, a certain type of water trough, we want to sort of acclimate them to those things before we wean them. Um, so a couple of days before weaning, um, it's suggested to move cow-calf pairs into the field or facility where the calves are going to be during the weaning period, and then remove the cows from the calves and not vice versa. And that allows the calves, again, to kind of acclimate before their, their mothers and their milk is taken away. 
Um, and during this time, we also want to make sure our calves are, uh, are going to have access to mineral, minerals and vitamins to support immunity. Um, again, um, vitamins and minerals are very important to maintaining a healthy immune system. And anytime there's a lot of stress, our immune systems can be compromised. So anything we can do to help support the immune system is, is good. There are a couple different weaning strategies. Um, the first of which is uh, what we call traditional weaning, where uh, there's complete abrupt separation from uh, the cow. Um, this weaning strategy is associated with a lot of vocalization and fence line walking um, by the calves. So they kind of pace the fence line looking for their mama um, for up to three days. And it, this can have uh, significant impacts on, uh, yeah, on weight gain during the, during the weaning period. Another weaning strategy is something called fence line weaning. And this strategy is becoming more popular. Um, where in this type of system, calves are gonna be separated from their dams um, by a fence for about a week um, before being completely separated. And the idea with this is you're kind of um, separating out those two main stressors. So you're taking away the milk, but she, the calves can still see its mother. Um, so you can still, they kind of, don't have to be completely separated from their mamas at the same time. Um, compared with traditional weaning, research has shown that this uh, method uh, results in less vocalization, less fence line walking, and better uh, body weight gains for the calves. Um, the last strategy is that I want to talk about is something called two-step weaning. Um, and in this strategy, they will put a plastic nose piece in the calf's nose. Um, to help it prevent, to prevent it from nursing. And then they'll put the calves back in with their dams for about a week, one to two more weeks. Um, and then after that, they will completely take the dams away. And again, similar to fence line weaning, the idea is kind of separate the two major stressors um, apart. So they're, it's not two huge stressors at once, it's one stressor, you know, you get a little bit of a break and then another stressor. And the calves have some, some time to adapt um, to each one sl uh, more slowly. Um, compared to traditional weaning, this type of weaning strategy generally produces less vocalization and less fence line walking. However, um, results in terms of um, advantages with weight gain during this, uh, with this type of strategy is highly variable. So some studies will show that the calves will gain more weight if you do the two-step weaning process compared to traditional weaning, whereas other studies will show um, that they don't have really any, any weight gain advantage. Um, if you are weaning a bottle calf, I mentioned before that generally this can occur around six to eight weeks of age, um, as long as the calf is eating at least a pound and a half of grain a day. Um, you don't have to wean this early, so if you want to feed milk replacer for longer, that's fine. Um, milk replacer is an expense and it is an extra you know, step in terms of um, labor man you know, work and labor management, so um, that's just something that's up to you. But if the calf is eating at least a pound and a half of grain a day and it's six to eight weeks old, it's perfectly capable of being weaned. Um, to wean a bottle calf, generally you're gonna to wanna to decrease to once a day milk feeding uh, for about a week, and then you'll take away all of the milk feedings after that. Um, and then after weaning, um, how and when you co-mingle the calf with other animals um, really depends on your preferences as well as what, what's going on at your farm. So if you have a group of calves and you wanna bring that, that, that bottle calf in, um, you know, they're all being weaned at one time, you can co-mingle them together, and that's usually not an issue. Um, but if you have like an orphan calf and a beef cow herd or something like that, um, that's a little bit trickier. Um, you can integrate them with the cow-calf herd um, as long as they do still have access to that high quality feed because if you need to remember that they're not getting milk from, their, from a mama anymore. So they need to be able to, to sustain themselves on high quality feed. Um, and it's important when you're doing any kind of co-mingling or integrating them with the group that you acclimate them to the new feed or water source and environment gradually. Um, so they do uh, kind of know what's going on and they are just not just thrown into the, thrown to the wolves and not know, really knowing what, where to get their food or where to get their water. Um, and it's important to observe the calves pretty closely during uh, the week or two after you integrate them to make sure that they are eating and drinking and um, growing still and looking healthy as well. So just some final thoughts as we wrap this up. Um, there is no one-size-fits-all scheme for calf management, so what works for you might not work for the, your neighbor and vice versa. 
Um, and everybody has different goals. So it's important to keep those things in mind as you go through this. Um, and it's also important to remember that there are, as I mentioned before, there are two critical times in the calf's life. The first is gonna be um, the first 24 hours where we're talking about colostrum intake and things like that. And the second is going to be at weaning when the calves are taking off their mamas. Um, those are two times when the calves are gonna be stressed. There's gonna be a lot of new things happening to them and um, their immune systems can be down during those times. So it's important to, to make sure you're monitoring those periods carefully. And lastly, it's important to make sure you're checking the calves as well as their cows at their uh, cow-calf pairs at least once a day to make sure they're eating and drinking, make sure they have available clean water, uh, making sure that they're exp expressing normal social behaviors of cows, they're not isolating themselves and things like that. Um, and you also wanna look for signs of illness um, or issues with mobility to make sure that they're staying healthy. And with that, we'll take any questions. Um, I don't know 